the the uh, significant date on the calendar that's coming up. Yud Beis Tammuz, the twelfth day of Tammuz, is the birthday of the previous Rebbe, of the Rebbe's father-in-law, and it's also the day <coughs> on which, in 1927. It's okay, leave it down. In 1927, the Rebbe was told by the communists that he would be freed from prison. Where he had been, we had been, in, been arrested, he had been in prison for um, about a month. From Tesvov Sivan, Till you'd base Thomas. A little less than a month. So in the next 12 days, today of course is the uh, first day of the month of Thomas. So for the next 12 days, it would be appropriate to, to uh, get to know a little bit about the previous Rebbe. Of all the Rebbe's, of all the seven generations, the previous Rebbe is the one that we know the most about. For the very simple reason that the previous Rebbe kept a diary from the time that he was nine years old. And through glimpses into that diary, parts of the diary that the Rebbe published and made public, we get an insight into the personal life, the growing up, of a Rebbe from the time he was a child, being raised by his father, and then eventually becoming the Rebbe, and going through probably the most painful, the most horrible uh, 40 years of Jewish history. The Rebbe himself went through Stalin and Hitler. And so he saw, he saw Yiddishkeit being destroyed spiritually in Russia, and he saw Yiddishkeit being destroyed physically in all of Europe. The Rebbe was one of the few people who were able to get out of the Warsaw Ghetto before it was destroyed. The Rebbe had been arrested by the communists in the course of his life, seven times. The last time being the most serious. The first time when he was 12 years old. But instead of getting into, uh, into a biography of the Rebbe, there's just one little piece of a diary that was very recently published that I think is... Uh, an incredible piece of, of historical uh, significance. I'll try to repeat it by memory, the way, the way it's written in the diary. The date is the 10th of Adar, the year 1927. Tafresh Pezayin. The Rebbe at that time is living in Leningrad. And he has to go for political meetings. He has to go to Moscow. This is a Sunday, and he's writing the entry in the diary on the train going to Moscow, and it's a trip of a number of hours.
he writes that for that Shabbos, knowing that he was going to be leaving Shabbos night to Moscow, so instead of making the Fabringen Shabbos afternoon and then repeating it again for those who recorded it and memorized it, he would repeat it again Shabbos night, but this time he wouldn't be there Shabbos night, he'd be leaving. So he made the Fabrenia Friday night and repeated it again Shabbos morning. And then a third time Shabbos evening when he would usually Fabren. So that the people got to hear the Mimer three times. A pity, he says in his diary, that I didn't have time to spend with the Chosid Reb Tzemach Dovid. This Chosid Reb Tzemach Dovid was an old man, and he remembers when his father, who had yet been a Chosid of the Alter Rebbe, took him on his shoulders to a certain town where the Tzemach Tzedek the previous Rebbe's great-grandfather was passing by on his way back from St. Petersburg where he had conducted a very difficult and dangerous battle with the government and had won. So his father took him on his shoulders to go see the, the Tzemach Tzedek. And when he grew up, he began going to the Rebbe, to the Tzemach Tzedek, regularly as a chassid, at least once a year. The first time that he came, he had told the Rebbe the story, and it's recorded in an earlier entry in the diary. The first time this chassid, Rebbe Tzemach David, came to the Tzemach Tzedek, to the Rebbe, among other things, when, they, when he saw him privately, the Rebbe said to him, Chai Chai Yeiducha. There's a verse in Torah. Chai Chai Yeiducha. Every living thing praises you. But the Rebbe said to him, Chai Chai Yeiducha, two times Chai is 36. The Chassid didn't know what this meant and what the Rebbe was, was, was alluding to. And try as he might, he couldn't figure out what the reference was. And he finally decided that since God knows that he means well, he wants very much to understand what the Rebbe said to him, but can't, therefore God will probably make it available to him when the time comes and he needs to know what it meant. That God will arrange for him to understand when he will need to understand. Seventy years later, he had gone to the Tzemach Tzedek for the first time in Tafresh Yud Gimel. And now it's Tafresh Pei Gimel. Seventy years later. Eb Tzemach David came to Lubavitch for a visit. At this time, the Tzemach Tzedek had already passed away, so he came to the grave of the Tzemach Tzedek. And as he was pouring his heart out in the tilim that he was saying at the grave of the Tzemach Tzedek, he suddenly saw the Tzemach Tzedek as he had seen him 70 years earlier in his room, dressed in his white Shabbos clothing, like the Kayin Gadol on Yom Kippur, with a very serious look on his face, and a Tzemach Tzedek said to him, Tzemach David, this is the 36th time that you've come to Lubavitch. Chai Chai Yeiducha equal, two times Chai equals 36. Tzemach David tells the story, and he says that he fell from 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 the excitement and from from the nervousness of of what he heard and what he saw, he fell on the uh, 
on the, on the side of the grave, and he prayed fervently that in the last days of his life he should manage to finish and complete the mission for which God sent his soul down to earth. He then went home and began to prepare to die. And he died at the age of 93. But in the meantime, he had come to the Rebbe, to Leningrad, to say goodbye, knowing that he was going to die that year. So the Rebbe says that he, he regrets, writes in his, in his diary, that he regrets that he didn't have time to spend with this chassid because he arrived, he arrived just before Shabbos and the Rebbe left right after Shabbos. But that he had agreed with him that on his way back he would, he would stop again in Leningrad and, uh, and meet with the Rebbe. Because this chassid, Rebbe Tzemach David, the Rebbe writes in his diary, has an incredible memory, total recall, with a very orderly mind, and there is so much that one can learn from him. The Rebbe is writing this in his diary on the train from Leningrad to Moscow. As in every trip, whenever he would go on the train, one of his daughters would accompany him to the station. In this particular case, my youngest daughter, Shana, accompanied me to the, to the station. From the place where I live till the station is eight minutes. Seven or eight minutes. Four minutes it takes to go from my house by wagon, by horse and wagon, to the station. And then I have three or four minutes to get on the train. And I plan it this way because I was told by a Mr. I forget the name, who was, uh, who was connected with the, uh, with the Jewish communist groups. I was told by him that the Jewish communists, the Efsektia, is lobbying, is pushing the government to, to banish me and my family and revoke my, my right to, to live or to have an apartment in Leningrad. and that they've been asking about me by my neighbors, and that they're following me around, looking for anything that they can find, that they can accuse me of some kind of a crime, and create a tumult. I'm not afraid of anything serious, but I want to avoid the, uh, the tumult or the, or the uh, And therefore, the less time I spend on in the street, and particularly in a public place like like a train station, where those with the seven eyes, <laughs> those with the seven eyes are constantly watching, the less time I spend there, the better. So he timed his arrival at the at the train station so that there won't be a minute extra to to, to spend in that public place. So my daughter accompanied me, and as we were getting onto the train, to the car in which my sleeping compartment was in, there was a man standing there, very coarse, very callous looking person, with eyes that were frightening, and as we walked by, or I got on the train, we had, we had three minutes to speak so uh, my daughter said to me that she didn't like the looks of this guy standing by the train and that it seemed to her that when we walked by he had given 
me a very uh, suspicious look and she's worried so she asked that when i arrive in moscow i should have someone call on the telephone and and say that an old the old man so and so is feeling better and that'll be the signal that this guy here didn't start any trouble and nothing happened from the 6 years in which I've been working, in other words, the six years since he became Rebbe, in the six years that I've been working, I've come to know from experience that in those cities where, where the, the head of the police is a, is a non-Jew, they don't pay so much attention to the shuls and the mikvahs and they allow, they allow Yiddishkeit to go on. But in those cities where the head of the police is a Jewish communist, the, the suffering is, has no end. And therefore, when the train finally began to move, I was able to breathe easier. The train that I'm on is apparently one of the new ones, one of the newer trains, because the compartment is larger than usual. It has a good solid table with a lamp on the table. And more important than anything else, it doesn't bounce so much. And if, after it picks up speed, it is still this steady, I will be able to write the mimer that I said yesterday on Shabbos. Actually, it was still Shabbos night that I said earlier on Shabbos. The train is, in fact, a steady one, and I've now uh, completed two hours of writing the mimer. I will uh, finish writing it in my free time once I get to Moscow. And in the meantime, the co the conductor knocked on my door and uh, asked if I would be willing to meet with another passenger who is a little bit further down on the train who heard that there was a Schneerson on the train and he wants to meet me. Depressing thoughts. Uh, came to mind. The horrors that Jews have had to go through and the oppression of all religious institutions and uh, the arrest of rabbis and shachtim. Because he was afraid of who this person was who wanted to see him. And as in all times, when things became heavy for me and my thoughts became sad, and, and heavy-hearted, I am reminded of that awesome day when I stood in my father's room in the year 1920, when he said to me, heavy clouds are covering the skies of Russia for 22 years at least. The Alter Rebbe said that any country that oppresses Yiddishkeit and that prohibits the study of Torah must eventually be destroyed. That's what happened to Nikolaev. He, he, he prohibited Jews from studying Torah so heaven sent a war against him, and he and all of his uh, advisors were destroyed. God will also eventually destroy the young Jewish communists, the anti-religious com anti -religious young Jews. But until such time, we will have to suffer a lot from them. The leaders of this new government 
concerning the leaders of this new government, L, period, will die while insane. He will be insane when he dies. T will be harassed and eventually killed. And S will do whatever the times dictate. Should it be necessary, he'll even put on a uniform. Thinking of what damage these communists, the Efsektia, has caused in these seven years since my father passed away, it is awesome and frightening and painful to think of how much we're going to suffer yet for the remaining 15 years. Because his father had said for 22 years for sure. And I began to cry from the depths of my heart. Thinking about this scene where my father had told me this prediction, literally a prophecy, concerning the future, I was reminded also of his concluding words, where he said to me, Yesef Yitzchak, in the work of spreading Torah with fear of God and the performance of mitzvahs, you should have self-sacrifice, not only in theory, but in fact. I told the conductor that now is not a time, it's not my custom to meet people on a train, and now is late at night, it's not a time for meetings, and that I was preparing to go to sleep, and I asked him to wake me at 6 o'clock. I went to sleep with a very heavy heart, and as I fell asleep, I saw a vision. I saw my father sitting at his desk, that stood between the two windows on the east side of his room. On the table in front of him were two candles, and a Kabbalah book, Priyetz Chaim, was open in front of him to the chapter on Purim, where it deals with the mystical uh, significance or the mystical role of, of Mordechai and Esther. And it was chapter 6. And as I walked in, my father put his silk handkerchief onto the safer, covered it, and said to me, why are you crying? In the month of Adar, you're supposed to be happy. The date in the, on the diary was the 10th day of Adar. And if your work is becoming very heavy, didn't I already warn you that in this work you have to have actual Messiras Nefesh, not only in theory? I woke up and I took a look at the watch and it was 3 o'clock in the morning. But I went back to sleep and I slept well and I woke up refreshed. In the morning, I, I washed and I davened, and I was notified by the conductor that the train which was supposed to arrive at Moscow at 9 o'clock had been delayed because of a search that they had conducted on a train ahead of us that had delayed all the trains, and that we won't be arriving in Moscow until 9.30. The time was now... Uh, 9 o'clock. He had finished davening about 8 o'clock. He had written some of the mimer. Now it was 9 o'clock. 
And he again repeated that this uh, traveling companion of mine would like to meet with me. I could no longer put it off without arousing suspicion. So I told him to give me 15 minutes to pack my things and get ready, and then I'd be glad to meet with him. Which would mean that there'd be only 15 minutes left to talk. And so this man comes in. I was surprised to see that he was wearing a hat. And he introduces himself as Mark, Mark Simanovich. And he gives me his title. I tell him my name. And he asks, and what is your title? So I said, Yid. He says, yeah, I mean, no, you know, everybody, oh, a lot of Jews. There are a lot of Jews. Every Jew is a Jew. Every Jew is a Yid. But what's your title? So I said, it's true. Every Jew is a Yid. But Yid is the true title. Because all other titles, if the owner of the title, the bearer of the title, sins, the title is taken away. But the title Yid, even when a Jew sins, it's not taken away. Because even when a Jew sins, he is called Yisrael. And this is because the essence of a Jew can't be destroyed. And this essence expresses itself in many ways, on many levels. There is that Jew who feels some kind of affinity to his people, there is the Jew who feels an attraction and an attachment to the teachings of his people. There are those who feel an attachment to the commandments of Torah, of Yiddishkeit. There are those who are devoted even to the customs of Yiddishkeit. And then there are those who are willing to die for any one of the customs, not to mention the mitzvahs. But all of this depends mainly on your upbringing and your circumstances in life. In that brief statement, by the way, the Rebbe said to him, assuming that he was a communist, the Rebbe said to him, number one, your title in a communist country is something you can very easily lose. Because as soon as you sin, the title is taken away and you're finished. But your Judaism, your identity as a Jew, that's going to remain forever. And that you're as Jewish as I am. Only the expression of that Jewishness differs. You may be a little bit proud that you belong to the Jewish people. You're a Jewish communist. And I am ready to die for any custom in Yiddishkeit. And the only reason that you're not is probably because you didn't have a good education. You didn't have a good chinuch. So the man says, I was born in Orsha, and my grandfather constantly spoke about a Lubavitcher Rebbe. Because his father and his grandfather over a hundred years ago, used to go to the Alter Rebbe, were Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe. And so when I heard the name Schneerson, I wanted to get to know you. And I'd like to get to know you better. The conductor came in and said, two minutes to... Uh... So the man said, I'll be busy in Moscow for two or three days, but on my, for the first two days, but on the third day, I'll be free. If you'll still be in Moscow, I'd like to meet. The next installment, next week. What does Palyetin mean? Palyetin. You know what that means? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. 
Mhm. Paletten. How do you? S yeah, probably. Um, how do you say uniform or medals? Huh? Special dress that everybody uses. No, no, no. Uh, like a like a a general wears the signs of the general. What is that called? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's probably what it's what it means. That when by by Stalin, the Rebbe said to him that if it'll become necessary, he'll put on his. I think what it meant was that he would that he would go to war against Hitler. So here we have a literal a literal prophecy where in 1920, the Rebbe's father said to him, this suffering for you is going to go on for at least 22 years. From 1920, sorry, from 1927, Now, from 1920, the 22 years began. In other words, when, the, when his father passed away in 1920, his father said this to him three weeks before he passed away. And I think I mentioned the other day that uh, he passed away saying that he can't live in the same world with communists. With a czar, he could live. With communists, he can't live. And so he left the world because he could not share it with atheists. So he passed away in 1920, and 22 years, 22 years after 1920, it was 1942. When did Russia enter the war? When, when was Stalingrad? So on the Hebrew calendar, it was already the next year, I think. I figure it out exactly. But it was 22 years later when Russia entered the war. And uh, after that, the Rebbe, the Rebbe was already out of Russia. The Rebbe was then in Latvia. So the 22 years was the 22 years of communism until World War II. Until Stalin finally did something good. And the Rebbe had said to him, 22 years for sure. Which seems that, makes it sound that like, af at the war there was a turning point. And after the war, communism could have gone either way. So the Rebbe said, 22 years for sure. After that, not so sure, maybe. Unfortunately, it was after that also. But in the meantime, Stalin did Jews a favor by uh, stopping Hitler, did the whole world a favor by, Stalin, by stopping Hitler. He also voted Israel into existence. Russia was the first one to vote for, uh, for the state of Israel in the UN. And then something happened and he slipped back. Went back to being... Communist 
Mm. Not they, he. <laughs> he. Um, when the Rebbe was arrested, the arresting officials were Jews. And during the questioning, the Rebbe kept stalling because he wanted his film. They would ask him questions and he would say, first, give me my film back. So one of the, um, the high-ranking Jewish communists got upset and he said, why are you wasting our time? We haven't got time to sit here all day. Answer the question. So the Rebbe said to him, you don't have time. Where are you rushing? There's nothing in this country you don't have to rush. Everyone will get their turn. <laughs> They'll come to you soon too. Don't rush. They'll turn against you too. It's a fascinating chapter in history that is really very little known. How the Schneerson family is, without any exaggeration, Russia's enemy number one. People go to visit Russia these days. Like every month, another Lubavitcher goes into Russia to bring in all the things that the Balai Tshuva there need. Mezuzas and tefillin and, and kosher food and books on all sorts of subjects and to answer questions. There's no rev there. There's no rabbi there. So every month a rabbi comes in and they ask, they save up their questions and they ask their questions and they pass in their shilas and so on. So you can bring in 34 mezuzahs. One guy carried in 34 mezuzahs. And they looked at it and they said, what is this for? And he said, and the guy said, because my tefillin, you know, they get, uh, the, the parchments in my tefillin can get spoiled. And I replace them, you know, to keep them fresh. They let it through. Even though they know full well that a mezuzah is a mezuzah and tefillin are tefillin. Every guard, every, every, uh, what do they call their customs official knows everything they need to know about Jews and Yiddishkeit and Torah and mitzvahs and so on. We should all know as much as they're taught about Yiddishkeit. Um, one, one rabbi and his wife were going to visit and they had with them four pairs of tulum. Four pairs of tulum. So the tefillin. So the guard, the guy opens up the bag. He sees four pairs. He says, "What is this for?" He says, "Oh, that's for my my religion, my tefillin." He says, "Yeah, but why do you need four? So he said, "You know, Hasidim put on two. Hasidim put on two sets of tefillin. So I put on two, and my wife puts on two. So the guy leans over to me. He says, "Ask any rabbi. Women don't have to put on tefillin." And he let it through. He let it through. But try to bring in a picture of the Rebbe, and they will hold you, arrest you for hours, and look through everything you have in your, ba in your bags. They'll tear everything open. Because if you're a Schneersonite, that's, that's, that doesn't go. That they won't put up with. Because the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe's great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, who was the first one to carry the name Schneerson, was a thorn in their side. They couldn't budge him. He stood up to them and, and they had to back down. 
his son, the Rebbe Marash, would travel all over the all over the world, bringing all sorts of pressure against Russia, not public pressure, pressure that counts from bankers, from investors, from other governments to stop pogroms and to stop discrimination against Jews and all sorts of stuff, made them miserable. And they couldn't threaten him and they couldn't intimidate him. They could do nothing with him. The Friedrich Rebbe's father, the Rebbe Marash's son, same thing. And of course, the Friedrich Rebbe, he made them crazy altogether. And even now, when there's no Schneerson in Russia, they know that every Jew who teaches Yiddishkeit in Russia and refuses to budge and refuses to give up is because they're in touch with somebody in Brooklyn whom they refer to as Grandpa. There was a Hasid who was allowed to leave in 1968-69. He was told he could leave because of intervention on his behalf by... Who was the Prime Minister of England at the time? Forget. Huh? Whoever it was. Prime Minister of England intervened on his behalf because his family, his wife and his son, lived in England. So when they gave him his papers and told him that he could leave to go to England, they said to him, understand that you are going to live in England. We don't want you running off to Brooklyn as soon as you get there. I remember living in Crown Heights, uh, not understanding as a kid, I was, didn't understand what was going on, but I knew that every now and then, a certain chassid or, or another would suddenly be out of town for weeks. Never understood what this was. It was this chassid or that chassid. And it was known that every now and then they disappear for a couple of weeks. I never understood what that was until finally somebody told me that whenever a suspicious-looking character starts hanging around Crown Heights, those Russians who got out of Russia illegally because they were wanted by the police, when they see an, a suspicious character, they, they leave town because they're afraid. Because the Russians followed them to Crown Heights, and whenever a chassid leaves Russia, he's followed for a couple of months, to see what he says and what he does and who he who he who he uh, associates with and who he deals with. Every chassid that was active, that was a leader in Russia, they follow him to see who he's connected with and so on. So when people say, uh, why do you ask the Rebbe for advice? I mean, how is he supposed to know? Uh, we're, ta we're not talking about ordinary people here. We're talking about people who can predict the future. We're talking about people who can stand up to a Russian government. We're talking about people who could communicate with their father after their father is no longer alive. I mean, we're not talking about another rabbi. The Soviet Union survives on, on misinformation and lies by basically keeping the people misinformed. That's how it survives. To have a group of people, even the smallest group of people, devoted to the pursuit of truth doesn't sit well in Russia. You can't have people running around saying truth.
And really, that's the whole story of good and evil in the world. Good is true, and evil is false. It's just a klipa. And falseness is terrified of truth. I mean, just like anybody who ever told a lie is terrified of those people who can recognize a lie, who you can't lie to. So evil is basically terrified of goodness, afraid of truth. Even our Yetzirah is afraid of truth. So as we get closer and, and more into Yiddishkeit, the Yetzirah goes crazy and fights harder. And suddenly you're finding issues and objections and, and uh, resistances you never thought you'd have. And just as before coming out of Egypt, Jews went through oppression in, in before going off to Israel, Jews had to go through the oppression of Egypt. And the same thing before Mashiach comes, there's also the oppression of, of the communists. And just as with Egypt, for an entire year, even before we left Egypt, there was light in all of our dwellings, in the Jewish dwellings in Egypt. In other words, Jews were already free and alive and uh, practicing their Yiddishkeit. The same is true before Mashiach comes, that even before Jews come out of Egypt, out of Russia, they will have the freedom and the light and the joy in Russia as a preparation to the coming of Mashiach.